choir, you're just knocking it out of the park every week. Thank you so much for that. There were a group of hunters that got together during hunting season on a Saturday morning, decided they would go hunting, and they decided they would group up in pairs and then hunt in pairs the rest of the day and then come back to camp at the evening. And so that's what they did. And there in the evening, one of the hunters came back uh, by himself, struggling under the weight of an eight-point buck that he had over his shoulders. And he came into camp, and he threw that down, and his buddies looked at him and, at him and said, Well, now, where's Harry, the guy he was hunting with? He said, Harry must have had a stroke or a heart attack back on the trail. He's about two miles back. They said, For crying out loud, you carried the eight-point buck and left Harry there? He said, Well, I didn't figure anybody would steal Harry. Poor Harry. <laughs> but you know, that story illustrates that whether we want to admit it or not, we spend a lot of time protecting our stuff, don't we? Um, we're in the midst of a series of sermons uh, based on the Ten Commandments. That series is called Words from the Fire. That's the title of a book that uh, Dr. Albert Moulder wrote, and I'm depending upon him throughout this series. This morning's sermon is about the Eighth Commandment, stealing. And the title of this morning's sermon is, Stealing is Really About Respect. And it's found in Exodus, the 20th chapter, verse 15. If you have your Bibles, I know it's just one verse, and it's a very short verse, but I want you to open your Bibles to Exodus 20, 15, because we're going to go another place as well here. So open your Bibles there to Exodus 20, 15. You know, I think it's an understatement for us to say this morning that stealing is prevalent in our society. Amen or oh me? It's there. And, you know, folks, as we said just a moment ago, that story illustrates that we, we just have to do some things to protect what we currently have. Uh, let me just give you some examples. And, and just to kind of bring this home, uh, I'm going to ask that you actually raise your hands here now. How many of you have ever had anything stolen from you personally? Just raise your hand. Look at that, folks. It's all across. Now, let, let's, let's add a wrinkle to that. How many of you have ever left your wallet or your purse somewhere or something valuable out in public and you've walked away and maybe 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later or whatever, you realize, oh my goodness, I left that at the restaurant or I left that at the mall. And you rush back there to where you know you left it and here's the wrinkle and you're shocked that it's still there. It's, yeah, I mean, folks, most of the time when we're in that situation, we rush back there, but in our hearts and in our heads, we're thinking, it's not going to be there. Somebody's picked it up, and it's gone. You know, it, it's prevalent in our society to protect our stuff because stealing is so rampant in our society. Uh, let me just ask you some questions. Uh, when, uh, when we're out and about, Let's say we go to the Valdosta Mall, and we're going to do some shopping. What's the last thing you do when you walk away from your car? Well, you lock it, right? Let, why do we have passwords on our computers and on our phones? Because we're afraid that somebody can access that information. Stealing, right? Here's a good question. Why do banks have vaults? Well, we know the answer to that. I mean, they're not going to have just a room back there with a little door and a little bitty lock on it, are they? No. Hey, why did we, two years ago as a church, put locks on our church doors? Because of theft. I mean, we, we had people who came in here and stole the TV, tried to steal. Did they try to steal that one? Or they, no, they tried to steal that one. They stole the one over there in the nursery. Now, the Eighth Commandment, in the midst of all of this, the Eighth Commandment sends out a strong and simple message. Do not steal. If you've got your Bibles open, Exodus, the 20, 20th chapter, verse 15, it says, do not steal. And that's straightforward. That's simple. I mean, there's not much we're going to do with that from an interpretive standpoint. And, you know, if there's anything, if we could just communicate that one thing to our world, our world would be in a much better place. Just don't steal. Just don't take other people's stuff. But, you know, behind that is something that we've, uh, we need to discover. We, we've seen throughout this study of the Ten Commandments that there's more to it, perhaps, than just what meets the eye, what's on the surface. And there's a principle behind this 
eighth commandment that we want to make sure that you understand here this morning. As a matter of fact, it's so important, we're going to put it up here on the screen. What's the principle behind the eighth commandment? The principle behind the eighth commandment is this, respect. It's really about respect. Stealing is really about respect. Now, this morning, uh, as we've already seen here, this Eighth Commandment, it's in a negative uh, form, do not steal. But we want to encourage activity here this morning, and so we're going to put it in a positive note, okay? We're going to put it in a positive form. This morning, I would much prefer to say something to the effect of, folks, let's make the right choices in life. Let's choose to not steal, all right, and see where that gets us. So let's do that here this morning. I want to use this opportunity here this morning to encourage us, based upon God's Word, to make good choices when it comes to other people's property here today. We're going to do it this fashion. We're just going to kind of fill in some blanks here, and the statement we're going to use is this. When we choose to not steal, we are choosing to, and here's the first thing we're going to put in place there, we are choosing to respect others. That's when we make the choice to not steal, we're also choosing to respect other people. Let's put this in the right context, all right? Here we have in the Ten Commandments God saying to this Hebrew people that he brought out of slavery, that he brought out of Egypt, he brought them to this mountain on the way to a promised land where he was going to establish them as a new community and a new land. He says to them, you have already seen what I've done for you. I've set you free from slavery and from Egypt. I proved my commitment to you. And so now I want you to be my covenant people. I will be your covenant God. But let's make sure that our understanding is correct. And God gave this covenant, these Ten Commandments, saying by obeying these Ten Commandments, that's putting you in the position to be my covenant people. And right there in the midst of these Ten Commandments, God says, and by the way, do not steal. Now, let's make sure we've got it in the perspective that we need it in. What's God doing with these people? He was getting ready to take them to the promised land. He was saying, you're going to become a great nation. For you as a nation to flourish and to survive in this new surrounding, for society to have integrity, he says, you must as a people recognize that as a nation, you must not steal from one another. Not only will that set you apart from the other nations, but it will establish you as a firm society amidst a society of peoples that do all kinds of things. God made it very clear in saying this to this nation. Part of this commandment is for you to go into this new area, be a new community, and be set apart as my people. And one of the ways that you're going to be set apart is by not stealing from one another. Keep your place right there in Exodus, but just go over just maybe a couple of pages, just two two chapters. Exodus, the 22nd chapter. Exodus 22. You know, here we have in Exodus 20, God saying very simply, do not steal. We may say, well, you know, that's good and that's enough. But look at Exodus 22 and just the first 15 verses. We're not going to read it. But if you'll just scan down through there, you'll see that all 15 of those verses has to do with stealing. Just look at the first verse. It says, When a man steals an ox or a sheep and butchers it or sells it, he must repay five cattle for the ox or four sheep for the sheep. Why is there so much space being given to this subject of stealing? Well, first and foremost, folks, there's all kinds of ways to steal. And secondly, God is trying to say to them, look, this is not just about taking other people's stuff. It's about how to relate to one another properly. Now, folks, it's not wrong for us to look at the Ten Commandments in general and say that the first four commandments basically are talking about our relationship with God, okay? And then the next six commandments talk about our relationship with one another, So right there in that second section, in the midst of that second section, a section of those commandments that's designed to help us know how to relate to one another, God says, here's something important about your relationships with other people. Don't steal from them. So essentially, what this eighth commandment is saying is this. Respect others by respecting their possessions. You see, God, even though we recognize that we owe everything to Him, that we are truly not owners, just stewards, God did establish the right of personal ownership of property. And for a society to flourish, God says you've got to respect other people by respecting their possessions. So when we choose to not steal, we are choosing to respect others by respecting their possessions. 
There was an example in the Old Testament. We don't have to go far for an illustration of this. Some of you who are in uh, Wednesday night Bible study, you know we're studying Genesis, and we're right in the middle of the, of the story of Joseph. A, a remarkable story, the story of Joseph. And we've already covered this, but previously, Joseph had been a slave in an Egyptian household to a very prominent Egyptian official, Potiphar. Now, while Joseph was a slave there in Potiphar's house, Joseph did everything with excellence. And it got to the point where Potiphar, this important Egyptian official, entrusted everything in his household to Joseph. Everything except his wife. And that's right, because Potiphar was married to her. Joseph was not. But I want to make sure that you got that firmly in your mind. Potiphar entrusted everything in his household except his wife to Joseph. That meant investments. That meant how the food, how the food was cooked or prepared. That meant keeping up the house. Everything. But you know, the story goes on to tell us that Potiphar tried to entice Joseph into having an affair with her. And you know, Joseph could have said, no, I'm not going to do that because that's adultery and that's wrong. And he would have been right on target. But it's interesting to see how Joseph responds his refusal to enter into this affair. Listen to what he has to say. No one in this house is greater than I am. Potiphar has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. So how could I do such a great evil and sin against God? I hope you heard it. Did you hear what what, what Joseph was really saying? He's saying, I have such a great respect for Potiphar that I could not possibly take something from him that does not belong to me, Potiphar's wife. Listen, folks, one of the things that we do when we choose not to steal is that we choose to give people the personal dignity that they deserve. Now, I recognize that there are are the legalists among us, and so they'll say, so, Brother Robbie, if we find somebody that we don't respect, it's okay to steal from them. Is that right? No, no. And truly, the answer to that is a serious answer. Let us not forget that every person on the face of the planet was created in the image of God. I don't care how badly they have marred the image, they are still created in the image of God. There still is a level of personal dignity that is afforded to them and is their right simply because they are created in the image of God. So folks, the answer to that question is this. Really, there should never be anyone that we encounter that we do not respect on some level. At the very basis of all levels, we can respect other people because they're made in the image of God. When we choose to not steal, we are choosing to respect others. Well, let's take that a step further. When we choose not to steal, we choose to respect ourselves. Hey, uh, l- let's make sure that we understand something here. And, I, and before we go any further, uh, we're talking about respecting others, uh, uh, ourselves, I mean. We're talking about respecting ourselves. That's the next step. We're not talking about an ego. We're not talking about uh, having an overinflated uh, personal opinion of yourself. But we are saying that we should have a certain level of respect for ourselves that we desire to be the people that God wants us to be. Now, this commandment that God has given us, do not steal, and any of the other commandments that we're talking about, or even any other command that we find in the Bible from God. Folks, let's make sure we understand When God gives us those commands, it's not because he just likes to boss people around, okay? He's just not bossy. He's giving us those commands because they are in our best interest. We've got to find find space in our theology to make sure that we trust God to say these things to us because of his love for us, and he knows that they are in our best interest. Let's just make it clear. Every known civilization that's ever been on the face of the planet from the beginning of time has had some kind of law, some kind of restriction when it comes to stealing. And the same is true here in our uh, nation, the United States of America. You may not remember this date in history, but on June 29th, 2009, a fellow by the name of Bernie Madoff was sentenced to 150 years in prison. 150 years in prison. What could he have possibly done to have received that severe of a penalty? He stole. Plain and simple, folks. Now, he ran perhaps the biggest Ponzi scheme this uh, nation has ever seen, and the estimates are that he stole from investors close to $18 billion. But, folks, it still just boils down to one thing, taking something that doesn't belong to you. In this nation, it's against the law. 
Listen, you, you choose to steal, if that gets uh, revealed in some kind of way, you're going to be in trouble. Now, let's go ahead and deal with how most of the people in our world deal with this commandment and other commands as well. Their approach is, well, you know, if you don't get caught, it's okay, right? It's just all about getting caught. If you don't get caught, then it's okay to steal. Just don't get caught. Just be careful, and you'll be okay. You won't be okay. Folks, when you choose to steal from someone else, you're also stealing from yourself. We've got to come to the realization that no matter how valuable that item is that we have taken from someone, maybe it had sentimental value, emotional value, maybe even monetary value, no matter what it is, no matter how valuable you think it is to yourself, your integrity and the respect that other people will have for you is far more valuable. And it is much harder to replace. When we choose to not steal, we're saying, this is the kind of person that I'm going to be. You see, at the, at the core of this issue of stealing is that very personal question, a question that you need to ask yourself. What kind of person am I going to be? Am I going to be the kind of person that has no respect for others and for myself and just take whatever I want? Or am I going to respect others and respect myself and say, you know, there's a line that, well, that I simply will not cross. Because, folks, remember, whatever answer you give to that question, what kind of person I'm going to be, you're going to have to live with that answer. You heard this story before. I think I've even told it to you, but it fits so well, I'm going to tell you again. Just act like you've never heard it. There was a carpenter, a master carpenter, worked for a billionaire. This billionaire built homes, commercial buildings. He always went to this master carpenter. We'll call him John. Those of you who are John, don't take offense. We're going to call him John. This billionaire would go to John and say, John, uh, whenever he had a special project, he would say, John, I want you to be in charge of it. One day he goes to John and he says, John, I want you to build a house, just a regular house, but spare no expense, buy the finest materials, do the very best you can in craftsmanship, and use the very best of all that's out there. Money is not an object. I need you to build this house. John gets started on that, and he begins the building process, and then he says to himself, you know what? I could potentially go get substandard material and pocket the difference. And his greed got a hold of him, and that's what he did. He would, he would turn in reports saying that he bought the finest marble, but instead he bought second-grade marble. And he would turn in reports that he bought the finest lumber, lumber, but it was really of a poor quality. After all, in his mind, he said, after I get the paint on there, it's going to look good, and nobody will know the difference. He gets the house done. He invites the billionaire to look at the house. He said, I've got the house done. The billionaire looks at it and says, it's wonderful, it's great. And John, here's the keys. I've had you build it for yourself. <laughs> and when we choose to steal in the same way, we have robbed ourselves of something very precious that is hard to replace, our personal dignity and our integrity. When we choose to steal, we're saying that we have no respect for ourselves. When we choose not to steal, we're saying, I'm going to have a certain level of respect for myself. I'm not going to cross that line. Now, I realize that there may be some of us here this morning who are saying, Brother Robbie, I've done so many bad things in my life that stealing, that's just one more thing in the list, and it's no big deal. And it could be that you're saying that because you really don't have much self-respect for yourself. You've made so many mistakes, you say, well, what's the sense? I've, I've already uh, uh, contaminated my, my walk with the Lord. I've already contaminated my life. What's the big deal? Listen, I want to make sure that you know something. And listen, if you don't hear anything this morning, I hope you hear this. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he shed his perfect, precious blood for you because he said you are worth it. Make sure you've got this in your mind. Jesus said, I would rather die than spend eternity without you. And that's exactly what he did. Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood, paying the price for our sin because he said, I want you personally to spend eternity with me. Now, if Jesus has that kind of love and sense of value for you, you should have a certain level for yourself as well. 
What kind of person do you want to be? I hope you want to be the kind of person that God will be proud of. And part of that means making sure that we respect other people by respecting their possessions. One final thing we want to say as we pull from this uh, particular commandment, when we choose to not steal, we are choosing to respect God. We are choosing to respect God. Folks, I know that in some of our minds it may seem unthinkable, but not only is it possible to steal from God, it happens on a pretty regular basis. Folks, uh, I'm just the messenger here, so don't start throwing hymnals, okay? But we have to come to grips with the fact that even as God's people, there's the potential for us to steal from God what rightfully belongs to Him. In the book of Malachi, the third chapter, verse 8, God is speaking to the nation of Israel through the prophet Malachi. And God asks this question. He says, Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. You ask, How do we rob you? And God responded, By not making the payments of 10% and the contributions. Now, God's answer was very specific. To put it in our terms, He said, You're robbing me by not giving what belongs to me, the tithe, offerings. That belongs to God. And when we don't give to God what belongs to Him and we keep it for ourselves, that's stealing. Let's put it in a perspective that's not very comfortable, but it gets to the point. Many of us around the world, perhaps even here today in this room, are driving around in stolen cars. Now, you've not stolen it from an individual, but you've paid for it with money you stole from God, so it might as well just be a stolen car. Some of us around the world are living in stolen houses. Not that we've stolen it from an individual, but we paid for it by money that belongs to God. Now, I know some of us here may be saying, oh, you're taking an Old Testament perspective. The New Testament says just decide in your heart what to give, and that'll be just fine. But listen, folks, you take that approach and say that means I can give as little as I possibly can, and you're saying this. You're saying, what's the least I can do and still be a Christian? And that is a poor theology. If we want to truly be the believers that God wants us to be, we should be saying, what is the most I can do for Jesus Christ? Not what's the least. When we say what's the least, that betrays our true motive. And our true motive is to glorify us, not to glorify Him. We also rob God by not giving Him the worship that He deserves. You know, there are people all over the world here this morning in sanctuaries, and they're in the midst of a worship service, but they've got their arms crossed like this so they can look down at their watch. And they are in service. Maybe they've been there for Sunday school, maybe they haven't. Maybe there's three hours of commitment there, maybe just two, maybe just one. But they're in a worship service, and th- but their minds are a million miles away. They can't wait for the service to get over with so they can go and do the things that they want to do. And listen, I know this is going to shock you, but there are even some church members that if the worship service isn't over at 12 o'clock, if it's 12.01, they're going to have words with the preacher. You better believe it. We're not going to beat the Methodist to the restaurant if you let us out at 12.05. We've got to be out by 12 o'clock. Maximum maybe three hours. Is that the kind of respect that God deserves? And while we're there, we're, we're thinking about what we're going to do afterwards? Or or wishing we were out fishing or hunting or at home? That's the kind of respect that God deserves? God tells us to pray with Him and and to Him. And through that prayer time, we learn who He is, and He speaks to us, and we speak to Him. But we can't even bring ourselves to say a 10 second prayer before we eat sometimes. And on Wednesday nights, we talk about all the prayer concerns. We'll take 20 minutes talking about the prayer concerns, and we'll spend two minutes praying. Something's out of balance. And let's just go ahead and say this, folks. A lot of times when we talk about the prayer concerns on Wednesday nights, we're talking about people's health, and that's fine. But listen, there is a bigger, a higher priority than somebody's stub toe. It's their relationship with Jesus Christ. If we should be top-heavy in the subject matter of our prayers, it should be a person's relationship with Jesus Christ. 
we're far too much focused upon ourselves and what we want. And that's part of how some people understand worship. They show up for worship on Sunday morning to receive something. Focus on this word, give. That's what we do when we come together to worship. We come together to give. There, there are people all over our sanctuaries today. They're, they're in the worship service. They haven't been in a few weeks, but they're there because they're saying, well, you know, I kind of need to do that to make sure my relationship with God stays intact and, you know, for God to, to, to pour into me and that kind of thing. Listen, we come together on Sunday mornings to give, and we do it to give worship to Jesus Christ. Yes, we can experience good things by hearing from God's Word, and yes, that can encourage us, but make no mistake, if you show up on Sunday mornings expecting that all this is done for you so that we can give something to you, you've got worship totally upside down. We're here to give worship to Jesus Christ, to exalt Him, to lift Him up, to let the world know that there's something more important than Facebook Or the internet. We also rob God by refusing to serve Him. Let's get something established. When a person comes to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the Bible says that they receive a spiritual gift. Every person who comes to know Jesus Christ then has, ex- has received this spiritual gift, and that spiritual gift is given, as the Bible says, to build up the church. It's to serve God by serving the church. That's why every church member has a spiritual gift, because if you're a church member, that means that prior to your church membership, you came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can't be a church member until you know Jesus Christ. Amen? So if you're a church member, then by default, you have a spiritual gift that God has given you to build up the church, to serve Christ. But you know what is the biggest problem that churches face down through the years and probably to come is getting church members to do anything. We think church is to show up and sit and soak. And you know what happens? We sit and soak and we sour like an old dish rag. Yeah, come in and let's worship together. Let's hear from God's word. Let's pray together. But folks, you are still here because God has something for you to do. We should be ashamed of ourselves that we've had to get up here on a Sunday morning and beg for children church workers. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Just, I, I may get fired, but it's a shame. How many people we got in this auditorium right now? Just a, just a basic rough estimate. Maybe 130, 140, 150 maybe. Folks, we don't have 150 positions in this, churches, in this church that need service. Not near that many. We've got plenty of people. We just don't have very much commitment. Now, I want to make sure we've got this in the right context. You're not robbing the church. You're robbing God. Because God has made it very plain. Not only are we to worship Him, but we are to serve Him. Folks, there's a reason when you got saved that you didn't just straight go to heaven right then. You know why? Because God has something for you to do. There's a spiritual gift that He has given you that he wants you to use to build up the church, to serve him. Now, that runs counter to the attitude that many people have about church where, well, I go to church because it makes me feel good, because I like it. Folks, some of the most important worship services I've ever been in have been worship services that made me feel pretty bad, that confronted me with the sin in my life and the responsibility I have as a church member and as a follower of Jesus Christ. Make no mistake, you cannot separate the two. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to be an active participant in a local body of Christ. This idea that you can be the Lone Ranger and just go off and do your own thing, that's not biblical. Never mind the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Never mind the fact that he's got a place prepared for us in heaven. While all we're concerned about is making sure that we get to the restaurant on time. Or that the church does what we want it to do. Or that my needs are met. 
Folks, we're here because God has commissioned us to meet the needs of others. Doesn't God deserve more respect than what we're giving him? I think he does. Well, now, folks, if we are guilty of stealing, then that needs to change. How do we change that? Folks, I think there's only one way. You admit to the person that you've stolen from that you've stolen from them. You've asked for forgiveness. And if possible, you make retribution. Now, you may need to do that out in the secular world in some kind of way. But I'm convinced that there are enough of us here this morning that need to do that with God, that that needs to be a part of our invitation. So I'm going to ask you to stand right now, if you would, please. Stand right where you're at. You see, it's very possible that today, based upon what God's Word has said to us, that some of us here have come to the realization, you know, I have stolen from God. I've not given Him the worship that He deserves. I've not said I'm going to be an active member in a church and serve Him in that capacity. I've allowed my finances to be more about me than about Him. And folks, the only way for that to be resolved is for us to go to God and say, God, I confess to you and admit that I've stolen from you. But here's the good news. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, as we said in a previous sermon, we're not going to hear during the invitation say, so all of you thieves come forward. Not going to do that. But there's probably not a single person in here this morning that can't find some way in their life where they have withheld something that belongs to God. We are all guilty, every single one of us. At some point in time in our life, we've made a decision in which we put ourselves first instead of Jesus Christ. All we're saying this morning is this. If you've come to the realization that there's any obstacle between you and God here this morning, we're inviting you to come forward and get that obstacle removed. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation here in just a moment to give you that opportunity to do that. And as we sing that hymn, that's your opportunity to respond, to come forward and say, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Or to say, I'm already a believer, but God has spoken to me this morning about my relationship with Him. And I'm going to be a giver from now on and not a taker. Is God speaking to you and inviting you to make a decision? If He is, you come as we sing. Steve, come and lead us. Thank you. 